Hi, this is Microsoft Virtual Academy. You're here watching XAML for Windows 10. This course is all about controls. This is module one. We'll be talking about the fundamentals of controls. My name's Jerry Nixon, developer evangelist here in the United States, live in Colorado. Here with my buddy, Darren. Darren, tell us who you are. I'm Darren May. I'm president and co-founder of Crank211. We are a digital agency that produces next generation digital experiences. And I also live in Colorado, despite my accent. Despite your accent, that's exactly right. Crank 211, mm -hmm. the finest digital experience maker that I own. That you own. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about controls, but before we do, let's just get a, a good uh, level set of what this course is and kind of what it means to you. And uh, so let's begin with we're going to have this in three modules. We're going to talk just about fundamentals, and then we'll build our own custom control in the second module, and then we'll go into detailed styling and, and managing your resources. So this will be fun, and it's a nice bite-sized course. Sounds good. Yep. If you're a developer and you've never made an app before for Windows 10, this might actually be a nice course for you, but it may be a little bit advanced. Uh, at the same time, if you are familiar with uh, C Sharp and XAML, this will be an excellent course for you to be able to take your skills to the next level. If you've never heard of those terms before, however, this could be a little rough. There's a lot of courses on Microsoft Virtual Academy you can seek out to get uh, a baseline, many of which Darren and I are the teachers in. Indeed. Yes, very You fun. nearly said stars, didn't you? I was going to say... You nearly said stars. Uh, that's yeah. what I wasn't going to say. <laughs> All right, so this module, we're going to talk about fundamentals. We're going to go in and subclass an existing control that already exists, and then we'll create a brand new control from scratch. We'll do one that's very lightweight in this uh, module, and then in the next module, we'll kind of uh, really get, get going with a custom control. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go into just the fundamentals. If you've ever opened up your toolbox inside Visual Studio, you know there's a lot of controls that you can go and use inside your application. Even if you're not interested in creating a custom control, it's very interesting to see how a control is sort of put together. All of these are made basically the same way, all by, of course, the platform team giving you all these nice controls to accelerate your development. And so out of the box, most of these are going to inherit from control, potentially content control. That's going to be a base class that we'll introduce a little bit later. Every once in a while, it's just framework element, which is a little higher on the stack, and we'll talk about that too. And there's different reasons to inherit from different things. For the most part, when we create our custom controls, we'll be selecting from control. Uh, there are also the, uh, the option to create a user control. You might uh, say file new object, or file new item, and select user control, create it one, and it shows right up in your toolbox like you would hope it would. That's beautiful. Or you might actually create a custom templated control, which is what we'll be talking about here. Beautiful. All right. So we talked about all the base classes and sort of the lineage of a control. So here we are. So this is, let's just talk about a button for a second. All the way down to the bottom, you can see that red box that represents the button. So that's the final control that was created. And in order to create that, it's going to inherit from button base. That's because, button, what, what, should we start at the top or the bottom? I'd start at the top. Let's, I mean, let's reverse that. Let's it's, it's pretty interesting if you think about it, just uh, the levels of abstraction that are present here mm. in terms of this hierarchy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight in the lineage. Eight in the lineage to get yourself to that final button control. And the reality is, this gives us an awful lot of power, as we're going to be talking about as part of this course, is how you can derive from these different aspects That's to right. get those different properties. But I think it's, it just shows the, the level of effort that's gone into the design of this framework to create these levels of abstraction. So we would start with object then. So object is the base of all objects, and so of course that's the furthest, deepest lineage. Then we go into a dependency object, which is where we really start introducing its capabilities into the uh, XAML framework. Mm -hmm. Then we go into UI element. So this is where we know it will be uh, part of the render pipeline. And uh, then we go into framework element, which gives, starts to give us the basics. And so, for example, the text block, which was one of the simplest controls you can bring in, just showing, up, showing your text is a uh, framework element. doesn't go into con and use control. Um, however, Framework element, then we add to that the control. So that gives us neat things like uh, manipulation of manipulation events so that we can drag, drop, and things like that onto a control, as well as all of its sizing and pieces like that. Then we go into content control, which basically gives us the ability to put something inside it. So remember, we're on our way to building a button. So we're framework element, control, then content control because it's going to have content inside of it. And then we build button base, and because there are three types of buttons inside our yeah. toolbox, the toggle button, the uh, repeat button, and the button button. And the hyperlink button. 
and the hyper. There are four types of buttons. Yeah. They all have a lot of repeated functionality, so why would you write all that four times? So that's where button base comes, and then we add button on top of it. That's the button button. Um, but if you had, I don't know what to call it, right? <laughs> that is button. the button. The button. Button. <laughs> if you look at, uh, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. If you look at the, um, if you look at the toggle button, it has the exact same lineage, of course, but it ends at toggle button instead of button button. That's what it does. <laughs> all right, a couple of really important um, uh, properties that we have in this lineage from the, all these derived classes. Through this inheritance, we get a framework element gives us style, default style key, and resources, all of which are going to be very important as we build out our custom control. Mm -hmm. So as we see style and all these other pieces showing up, you might wonder where they come from. And they come kind of far back in the family tree. And then the fourth one is we also have template. Of course, we're going to be building a templated control. Where do we get this template prop, uh, property? We get it from control itself. So that's beautiful. Those four aren't the only thing we really care about, but those are the four core ones. And that's kind of how they all come into a button. But you could drop button base, put your control in there, and that you're going to have a very similar lineage as well. Yeah, it also shows just how you can um, access existing controls and do a heck of a lot with them in terms of the, uh, the framework element style. It just yeah, yeah, shows right. you that foundation that's baked in, in enabling you to theme any of your controls. So if you could step back and just kind of consider what defines a control, there's two parts. The first is the, the class itself. So, you know, that's this blue box over on the side. And uh, we get all of our out-of-the-box um, implementations um, all inside a WinMD. That's a Windows metadata file that uh, brings in all of the stuff that the platform team has created for us, including the button. And so that has nothing to do with the way that the button looks. This only has to do with the way the button acts. And so we have the button class that comes into that, uh, that API contract that we get. Then there's this other side, this orange side. Right? That's the button template. So this only has to do with the way that the button looks. It has nothing to do with the behavior of the button. That's, that is true, I suppose, but I guess visual states kind of makes sense. Visual states kind of uh, blurs the line a little bit because there is a dependency there in terms of having those visual states available. But I think you know, the key thing that we're talking about here is it's that abstraction mm -hmm. that uh, you define a behavior and then you define one type of look but it allows you to re-template that and create many different looks. Yep, that's behavior. exactly right. And so out of the box, you get this, uh, you get the button class inside the WinMD, but then you get uh, the template inside. It's packaged for you inside a generic XAML. It's a file that's intended just for this. It's all uh, compiled up for you inside the PRI. Yes, indeed. Package, package resource index. Yes, it's all, all compiled up for you, so it's nice and efficient. And why would you separate it like this? Because wouldn't it be great if you could keep all the functionality of a button, but re-template it so that it looked perfect for your application without having to rewrite all of its functionality? That's the reason they're separated like this. So we can define the way it looks on one side, we can define the way it acts on another, and we can swap those and make them uh, so we don't have to rewrite the So we button. could make our button look like a gel button. Because yeah. I think every tutorial ever when this happened or a was a gel button. Let's retemplate it to a circle. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Lovely. That's great. We might do a circle to, just for fun, just to show we can do it. Um, I don't want to do that. No. <laughs> anyway, that's those so are the five two years parts ago, of Jerry. Every control. We're talking about a button here, but that's this is true with every templated control, and it's like that, so you can retemplate it. All right. So that's beautiful. All right. So let's consider what makes up a what makes up your your control when it's in memory. And so let's start with over on the top right here. This is we're going to add a button to a grid. We call that the logical tree. And so this is how your XAML is actually written. In this case, there are only two things, right? There's the grid, and then there's the button. And so you would expect for those to be the two objects in memory, but that's not right because a button is actually a complex object that requires many things to be in memory. So if you take the button and you go over to what it looks like in the visual tree on the left, we see the button, but then we see new things coming under it. So we, now we see there's a grid to make a button, and that grid contains a content presenter. And inside that content presenter is a text block. And so you'll remember the button has a content property. Of course, you could add your own content here and make your own visual tree. But out of the box, you can see that there's more to a control than just what you see in the XAML. The XAML is just representing um, the control it's itself, a, yeah, it's not, not what's going to be in memory. Yeah, right. There absolutely. you go. There you go. 
thousand words a minute, and then zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what happens when you outpace your brain. Right. One interesting point I'll just say is the content presenter, which is used inside any control template to bring in the content. That is special in two ways. Um, one, it gives you a couple of properties like transitions that are really nice. But more importantly, it will handle the reparenting of an element for you. So inside that button, you might just put text, but you might actually put your own grid in some uh, other thing you want it to look like. In order for that to work properly in XAML, it has to be, every element has to have a parent inside the overall tree. Mm -hmm. The content presenter handles that for you and reparents it for you, which also means there's going to be a limitation that if you have two content presenters inside your template, you're going to get an error because you can't, temp you can't parent something two Twice. times. Absolutely. Uh, in order to see um, the visual tree, conveniently, Visual Studio has given us the visual tree uh, viewer. Viewer. <laughs> oh, you see things with a viewer. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I think that's the technical term, Jerry. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's uh, switch over to your machine. I yep. know that you've got it running. Give us just kind of a feel for how that looks and show sure. us. Sure. So first and foremost, we've got a little bit of a more complex scenario here rather than the grid and the button. But, yeah. well, but when you look at the XAML, it actually seems pretty simple. It seems pretty simple Seven and straightforward. Lines. We've got a list view. Inside the list view, inside its default content, mm -hmm. we have a list view header item, and we have four list view items. So let's quickly run this up. Of course, the list view is our repeater, so yep. it's, uh, we'll build that out for us. So we you end up seeing the, uh, the best UI ever. Nice. It is one of the better I've seen you do. It is. It is. And so here is the live visual tree. And so what we have over here is the ability. Now, wait a minute. Uh, so the live visual tree you pulled over, and if everybody's looking for it and they can't find it, it might be because you're not debugging. It appears yes. when you debug. Yes. That's the live part of this, that you actually have to have the app running. You have a special mode you can select, which allows you to select elements within a running application. So I'm going to choose that. I'm going to bring up my application. And now we get this red outlining. And this is created for us in this particular mode so we can select items. So for example, I'm going to home in on this particular text element. If I click on this, our live visual tree navigates to that item. And as we can see, there is a vast difference in this uh, yeah. memory view of what we actually have as opposed to how we declared the XAML. We can see that the text block is actually injected into a list view item presenter, which is contained within a list view item, which is in an item stack panel, which is then inside the items presenter, which is inside a scroll content presenter, and so on and so forth and so forth, <laughs> I will. until we go up the list view. Now, yeah. we're going to touch on items controls in a later module, where we're going to go into more detail around many of these elements and so on and so forth. But what you can see is XAML, is, its power is in how succinctly it's been able to express this UI, and this is what's happening in runtime to actually build out a render, what yeah. is, in reality, quite a complex control. Yeah, and as a control developer, um, you may or you may not uh, be aware of all these intricacies, right? Sometimes you're so deep in the template, you understand every single piece that's needed in order to make your application or your control look just right. Sometimes you just accept it as well, right? You get that content presenter and it's thrown in there for you and it's good to go. It's important though that you see it all there and you start realizing a control as simple as a button or as simple as a list view might actually have a cost as well. And so understanding the visual tree can help you appreciate the cost that's there as well because everything, the deeper your tree, the more costly your tree. There's no getting past that. So as you design your own control, as we go through this course, um, consider the uh, performance impact as you start adding more and more layers. Sure. And if you just want to switch back to my um, Visual Studio for a second, one of the other key things that the, list, that the Live Visual Tree gives you is the ability to interact with the properties of a running application. So if I hit right-click Show Properties, I actually bring up my um, item that was selected, and this is item, item two. two. Mm -hmm. And let's put in debug as a value. And now if I switch back to my app, we can see that the text has changed live. Nice. So we can do a number of different things here. We can influence all manner of properties and so on. So if you've got a particular glitch you may be seeing visually, you can use the live visual tree to track down what's going on. It can also show you where your styles are being inherited from and so on and so forth. So it's a very useful diagnostic aid as well as giving you greater insight into how your application is being laid out. So let's look at how you actually define a control and how we got all of those layers, and that is the control template. And so the control template is something you define as a developer, and um, so this is an example of the syntax of how you would do that for the button, right? And so this is a simplified version of the button, of course, but it still rolls with it. And uh, so I have a control template object, 
And you can see I've targeted specifically for the button. Every control template has to be targeted for the type of control that it's going to be templating. And uh, we set this in a lot of different ways in how you apply a template. And so we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But then you can see there's that grid, and then inside it is the content presenter. And then the content presenter itself is bound to the control, to the content property of the button. So remember, now we're no longer in a button because there's no such thing as a button. What we're in is a grid, and that grid has a content presenter going back to the implementation of a class called button. And so it has a property called content that we're using template binding, which sort of brings up an interesting uh, discussion point here of how to bind inside a content template. So we as developers know there are three ways to bind inside XAML. Uh, the first one, of course, is using, um, I guess, classic binding, yep. using the binding classic. syntax. Still nothing wrong with that. I still use it all the time. Um, then there is this idea of template binding, which we just showed. And then there's also uh, XBind, which we introduced here in Windows 10. So let's talk about which one you would use in content template and why each of these exists. Uh, the first one is binding. Would you use this inside a template? Of course you would, because yeah. it does all kinds of things. It is the most flexible binding solution available. It is the most. That's exactly right. And in this particular example, you can see its relative source is set to the templated parent, which means um, if it was inside that grid or whatever, it would be referencing back to the button implementation. So that's great, right? I'm reading from the content path. In fact, if I were to go down and see the second one, template, uh, template binding, its path is also content. Both of those are identical in that they're both reading from the content property. Which one would you choose from, though? Well, there's only one difference between them. Mm -hmm. um, that is that mode equals two-way is set for binding. That allows, if it's written then inside, I have this unusual scenario, but yes. if it were to be written into the... Uh, and updated somehow by the presenter, it would also update the button implementation as well because it's two-way binding, not just reading from the button, but also writing back to the button. Template binding doesn't do that, and 99% of the scenarios where you're binding back to a control, you're really wanting to flow that control into the UI anyway, so two-way is not a big deal. So then you might be thinking, okay, so I can use template binding instead of binding. Fine. There will be times when that two-way is important. Mm -hmm. When it's not, though, template binding is the right choice, and you might be wondering why. So then we can go into XBind, which we know is the most performant way to data bind inside XAML because it's all pre-compiled. There is no XBind inside a template, however. That's on purpose. That's because XBind requires an underlying class, and there's no way to define the underlying class inside a content template. So even though you may be tempted to uh, kind of dabble with XBind inside your template, it simply won't work, so there's no reason to do that. Yeah, don't do it. But, um, so why is template binding there? Why is XBind not there? Part of the reason is because template binding is so efficient that XBind might not give you the gain that you even need for the extra work to be able to have an underlying class and assign the data type to it. So that's pretty awesome. So now you're picking between two, template binding and binding. When do you use template binding? Almost all the time because it's extremely efficient. When do you use binding? Maybe only when you need two-way binding. Exactly. You know, the reality is it's a much more efficient mechanism. We've talked previously about how so much of the drive in XAML for Windows 10 has been around efficiency mm -hmm. and bringing in that extra speed and performance across everything. Generally, where we've got these types of templates, there's going to be multiple instances of these things. Yeah. And you want them to run as quickly as you can. So the default is going to be template binding unless you can't use your particular scenario and then in the demo we'll have in the next module where you're going to be using a checkbox. And there's an example of two-way, right? Mm -hmm. But every other binding in the template is going to be using template binding. So yep. pretty nice. All right, so let's talk about where then these templates exist. So um, there's a folder called themes, and there's a file called generic. And that's where it all exists. And uh, it will all be compiled for you, but before it is, um, it all exists in generic.saml, and that's where all the default styles for every um, control in your toolbox. So you drag in a button and it has a default look to it, which font it's going to use, default size that it's going to have, maybe a background color. All of that is set up in generic XAML. Then we have default, default templates, how, what, what, how many grids are in a button to mm -hmm. make it work. All of that's actually defined already inside its default template that's located in generic XAML. And then things get applied in that order. So we start by applying generic XAML. And if there's anything that needs to override that, it'll be in your application. Anything that needs to override that, it'll be in your page. Anything that needs to override that will be in the control, and so on. We're just constraining the scope all the way down. It could actually be more steps than that, of course. Yeah. 
Um, all right, then um, it's important to note all this is automatic. You get generic.xaml for free. Yep. And uh, as we start creating uh, sample controls, you'll see all of a sudden there's a generic.xaml. But it might be fun to look at generic XAML. So this is the path where you would find generic your generic XAML if you have installed Visual Studio. Because um, then, because you don't get Windows kits without Visual Studio, I don't think. Do you? Do with the SDK. Uh, you, you can download them. Oh, you can independently. Um, but uh, well, either way, if you have Visual Studio, you're more likely to have it, right? Exactly. And uh, you can see a couple of interesting things. First of all, it's in program files, but down here below, you can see this is the specific uh, one that shipped with ten two four zero. Which, which happened is, to be the RTM version of Windows 10. That's right, the first RTM version of Windows 10. Yep. And, so, uh, and then we go to a file that looks like this. I'll pop it open just so we can see. It has both theme resources, which are specific types of styles for um, light, dark, and accessibility, or a, a high contrast. And then generic is where all the definitions are. So I'll open up Visual Studio Code. You're so cool, Jerry. Ah, oh, that's such a, I mean, that's the new toy of the day. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so now, I mean, it's a gigantic file, right? If I were to yeah. scroll all the way through, You'll see that it takes about a day and a half to get all the way through. So I would recommend... We will recommend, be asking questions on this later, so make sure you read it. That's right. <laughs> um, I would recommend that if you are going to create a, um, a templated control, that you would look and see maybe how the button... So I just happened to get right to the button. That's awesome. That's incredible. And you could see how like the button was, was put together. And uh, so you could see it, it has its default uh, styles right here. So its default background, its default foreground, and so forth. And then it goes in and sets the property of template. Well, remember, we get that from control in our lineage. And uh, so inside the template, we set a control template that's targeting button, and then we build it out to look however we want, starting with a grid in this case, right? And so your so control might be different. So many controls do start with grids. I mean, most do, it seems yeah. like, but yours may not. You know, it's really up to you. And I think it's actually in our sample, it starts with a stack panel. <laughs> and then, and so here they've defined all of their visual state groups, right? So this is because they're going to switch between things like pressed, unpressed, disabled, hover, things like that. And then here's the actual content of the control. Has uh, a handful of properties, but you'll notice template binding all throughout. But this allows me to take whatever it is that you put in the button, retemplate it inside all of these controls inside its template, so, or reparent it, I mean, mm -hmm. inside this template. So it's really, really nice. Actually, it's quite simple if you just think about the pieces. Yep. But uh, just to get it right, it's not a small amount of work. I mean, yeah. you're gonna, you're gonna, the you're visual gonna states tweak. is where a lot of your work up, comes in. Yeah, thank goodness for visual states. So many developers. Don't play with them, but they don't—they don't know what they're missing. They do not know what the. Look at this object, just like last time. Right? So this—the uh, point I'm making here is object uh, animation using keyframes and this discrete object is uh, because it's not using Visual State Setter. That if you extracted the template from the PRI today, it would—it would look slightly different because it would use all the new setter syntax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is—I mean—it's going to be doing the same thing. This just gives you. Uh, what it was right before they re refactored them all, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, so that's generic XAML. Remember, um, uh, usually developers never see this. It is hidden from you and it's injected into your application for you, um, and, but you get all the benefits of it. It's applied first, and then all of your custom styles will override that if, you, if they do. All right, so um, in fact, let me show extracting a template. Yeah, why I think not? that's going to be really, really nice. All right, so I'll open up Visual Studio, and I have a simple button here. I've colored it red. And it's got a, a save icon and a save text. So there it is, not, not a big deal. And uh, here's, here's how you would be able to see what the template is that create that makes up this, um, makes up this button. Remember, you could go to generic XAML and look at it there. Or I could just right click it in the designer. You can't do this in the editor. You have to do this in the designer. And say, um, edit template. And then edit template, you could do three things here. I could edit the current template. So if I had a custom template already created, this would navigate me to it. Yeah, I don't it's not going to allow you to edit generic.xaml, which is why that's grayed out right now. So now the only option is to edit a copy. Edit empty, that is for, that, that's for the Jedi Knights. <laughs> <laughs> that's if you want to say, hey, I need nothing. Yeah. I'm starting from the ground up, and I know everything I've got to put in there. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's not either you or I. <laughs> no. <laughs> Talk about the opportunity to get things wrong. Yeah. All right, so. I will, uh, I will say edit a copy and it'll ask me, all right, really what it's saying is I'm about to pull this out of the PRI or the generic XAML that's hidden from you, and I'm going to put it in your application for you so you can edit it. Where do you want it to go? I'm going to call it button style one, that's fine with me. I can put it at the application level, which means it would go into app XAML, or I could put it into this document, which means it would go into page.resources, or I could put it immediately on this control, which means it was put into the button.resources, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'll put it at the page resources so things don't get ridiculous, and I'll say go. 
and you'll see tons of stuff. In fact, and things me, got ridiculous. Let me back up. It, <laughs> it's a it's very small amount of code. Yeah, yeah. The code is small. It's easy to read as well. <laughs> and it is, um, and it, it's already applied. In fact, let me go back down to the button and forget that for a second. Just look at the button again and see what's changed. So I'll just hit an enter here. And so now the style of the button has changed so that it pulls from a static resource. That's a local resource in our application that uses this button style one, which is defined above. So this no longer pulls from generic XAML. Now it only pulls from button style one. And now, of course, there's some disadvantages with that in that we've now broken the inheritance chain from generic.xaml. So if in a revision, yeah. some change to how the style for a button control actually is in implemented in generic XAML, you're not going to get that automatically now. That's right. If there's some sort of error inside the template that it, it, just a small tweak will be fixed in version 10.1, then um, you won't get it. Yeah. Because right? you're using it. Right, exactly. And so that's worth knowing that every time you're revving your app, uh, if you have um, re-templated a control, it might pay just to pull out the template again from the, whatever the new version is and see if there are any changes to it. Yeah. It, so certainly a best practice that I've found is to clearly mark the changes you've made in a style or a retemplated control. Put comments in there and so on and so forth so you can quickly extract just those parts so that when you re, uh, redo the extraction, you can drop those back in and still have everything else in place. Pretty controversial saying that Comments are a best practice. <laughs> I know. It's wild and crazy. <laughs> it's, you heard it here first. <laughs> Comments. <laughs> All right. So let's go and look at it. So uh, again, here's my button. It points to button style one. This is button style one that was just brought in. It set all these default properties, which are great because now I can go in and change those if I want to Looks or leave them alone. Looks similar to the generic.xaml you were just looking at. That's right. That's right. And then uh, here are all the, uh, the uh, um, what is it? There's the control template itself being set. I don't know. <laughs> Good grief. You throw me off, man. You throw me off. All right, no. Um, and these are the visual states, and I will just show you the slight difference between them. Not with that one, but I'll show you point over that. Oh, I take it all back. I take it all back. I pulled it right out, and it's still using the discrete mm -hmm. object. And now, that's not true in some, in like in checkbox and stuff that are all different, have all been up updated. All right. And so, disregard everything I said earlier. I think most people do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the content presenter. So the important part here is this is now your opportunity to make some sort of change to it. So I could go inside this content presenter and I could add an ellipse. <laughs> and yes, I could. Glossy gel. I could put glossy gel around it. Because remember, I'm inside a grid, so from this point it's just XAML. <laughs> You're now almost itching to do so, aren't you? I am. <laughs> I, I, can, I just put something that'd be nice? And uh, anyway, so I could go in here and make this look however it is I want, or do this to any other control and make it look however you want as well. Now, leaving it inside this page is great because every time I use a button on this page, I can reuse this style. That still may not be enough for me because I use this button on several pages. So I might move it up to my application or even outside to a um, resource dictionary. Yeah. So you could actually pull up, you know, down on the button itself, you've got background red and so on. You could actually pull those up into the style now and not have to call them out locally. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. If I wanted red and white to be defaulted, right? I can take yep. that off. You can see it goes back to whatever it was. I can go here to background's going to be red. Click, click, click. Yeah, just like so. And you can see it's already changing in the designer and white. Yeah. Yeah, and so they'll automatically apply. However, if I still needed to go down to my button and say background green, it would, or Gainsboro. <laughs> Why not? Or green yellow. <laughs> like, green is a really difficult color to type. Well, you try typing white and not get wheat. <laughs> <laughs> I always do, actually. Or I type text and I get template. Uh -huh. I always do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, all right, so there I can easily override it, of course, as well. And I could add more functionality in here to say, if I'm not logged in, it's disabled. If I am logged in, it's not, it, it's enabled. Yeah. So, or whatever functionality is right for you. Remember, though, um, behavior isn't really what we're changing. That would just be, in fact, take, I take back everything I just said. Because that w this, we're only changing the look of the control, mm -hmm. not the behavior of the control. We're only changing its template. If we wanted to change the behavior of the control, we'd have to subclass it, which yeah. I hope we cover soon. There's, yeah, that's almost foreshadowing. But there is some interesting things we can do with adaptive code is we could turn around and create, add some visual states in there that use the uh, adaptive code trigger to actually change some of the presentation based yeah. purely upon size. Yeah, you're right. We could use any kind of trigger with any kind of logic inside it. Yeah. Add it right here. It would automatically fire at that visual state, which, which would change its visual 
somehow. Yeah, as an example, in a previous session with the uh, pivot mm -hmm. template, what we were actually doing there was we introduced a narrow and wide to toggle how the uh, uh, tab presentation of the pivot control looked on a narrow and wide device. In fact, looking at the names of these visual states, I think it's worth pointing out that if you were going to right-click and edit empty, mm -hmm. um, that these visual states are expected. And, yes. and not to have them there really introduces a lot of um, a lot less behavior, a lot less functionality inside your control. And so if, n if for nothing else, you should, um, you should get a copy just to get the names of the visual states. And then if you're like gung-ho to do it all from empty, at least you've got the names of the visual states to go on. It'd be cool if there's a way to query for the visual states. Yes. More foreshadowing. All right. <laughs> I love it. All right, so that's uh, retemplating an existing control. We just took a button and we changed it so it had some default colors. And uh, wouldn't it be great if we could subclass an existing control, change its behavior without changing the way that it looks? Ah, I'd okay. really like to be able to do that, and this is the syntax to do it. It is ridiculously complex. No. <laughs> it's like one, <laughs> one line. All right, so let's say you have my button, and this is the new button that you're about to control, co create. And you're going to inherit from button, and of course, because this is just regular old C sharp, as soon as you inherit from button, you get all of its functionality, and you're done. Oh. That's it. Perfect. Now you've got my button declared as an element in your uh, XAML, and away you go. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, in fact, let's go ahead and build it. Now, this is going to be, there, it behooves the developer, if they do this, to do a couple of small things, and we'll do those together. All right. Uh, here I am inside Visual Studio. I am going to back up so I don't have a retemplate because I don't care about that right now. In fact, let me just one more time. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things. How many changes did we make? All right, now we're back. All right, so we got a simple button. All that styling business is gone. And I'd like to add another button, but this time I'd like to add my custom button, which I'll add inside a quick, um, of course, create a place to put those, namespace for controls. And then inside that, all I really need is a class, which I'll call my button. Which is interesting, because uh, you know, most people think about creating some other type of uh, object when they're in there. That's right. Like they have to say, find new control or something like yes. that. And then remember, it needs to inherit from button. And there it is. It's inheriting from windows.ui.xaml.controls.button. So I get everything. And I will make this public because I'm about to create a control library that I'm going to sell for a fortune. Yeah, I, I can see the potential already. <laughs> Inside the constructor, I will uh, let this constructor call the buttons constructor. And I will ensure one thing that the system doesn't know, and that will be the default style key. So the default style key is saying, when I do run um, this and I apply a generic XAML to it, which of those styles should I apply to this? So you would think you would get button, but you actually don't get button because I've just created a new class. So all I have to say is type of button. And this is me saying to the subsystem, really, that's going on, that uh, when you're looking for a style to apply to this, please apply the button, because I'm not changing the way that it looks. I'm only changing the way that it um, behaves. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then from this point forward, I could add new events. I could add new properties. I could even add methods to this. I could make it so it ties into our login system to make sure that the user is or isn't uh, an administrator. I can do anything that I want. Meanwhile, the UI of the button all looks exactly the same. And I guess to make sure that you believe that, I will yeah. just add it to the People UI. know you too well. Yeah, a little no, nothing to see here. All right, so now inside my toolbox, see up here, here's my button. The reason it's there is because I just built my project. Uh -huh. Doesn't show up. Slight of hand. Build. That was a slight of hand. It was a slight of two, fi three fingers. Control Shift B, and so I'll drag this down. You see a couple of nice things. I got my namespace automatically created for me. It goes straight to App to Controls namespace, which matches the folder that I created. And there's the button right there. And you can see it looks like a standard empty button. Standard empty button. <laughs> not, not much going on there. If I were to take all of the functionality of this, though, and just apply it to our button instead of that custom button, it looks just like a normal button. The reason is it's inheriting from the button, getting but everything. But at least now you can button. say it's your own. Now I can say it's my own. And if I, really, I really wish that every time this was clicked, that it wrote, for example, a, um, a log entry or mm -hmm. had some sort Added of metric around it. This would be an easy way to do it without having a whole bunch of stuff cluttering the rest of my application. That's a really good use, actually. Yeah, it's just kind of rolled in. Yeah, it's nice. It's a strange how th these things happen. I know. Once the flow is in, you can't exactly. help it. It's, it's exactly. Adrenaline. And then the brain goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> uh, what, what are we doing again? Yeah. All right. So the first thing we did is that we subclass. No, no. The first thing we did is we retemplated an existing control, leaving its behavior alone, but making it look different. The next thing we did is we re we subclass an existing control, leaving its look alone, but adding new behavior to it. Pretty simple. Pretty nice. Did you want to add some behavior to it, like a click event or something like that? Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. Every time this button clicks. Uh, we will make it, uh, whoops, there we go. I'll make a, a box pop up. How Sounds about like that? A plan. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I'll say a new message dialog. And then we'll put in hello, Darren. Oh. <laughs> now I can see the potential for sale. Yeah, this is suddenly, I've got, I've narrowed my audience to one user. <laughs> uh, let's see. I need to make this an async method. And I have pennies in my pocket. Oh, yeah, that's good. Free dinner. All right, so um, now every time that this button is clicked, of course, every time this button is put anywhere, yeah. that's what's going to happen. And uh, let me, in fact, let me back up. It's the perfect foundation for a library, I, I tell you. It's going to be terrific. And so let me just change the outer here to a, a stack panel instead of a grid. Like that. All right, so now I can add a couple of them because it'll be far more fun if I can click a whole bunch of buttons. And say hello to me. Many right. Times. Let's see, right here. Copy, paste, 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 paste. Bam! That's what Stack Panel does. That's what Stack Panel does. <laughs> All right, so. Our work here is done. Yeah. There's a lot of saving going on here. Save. Hello, Darren. Save again. Hello, Darren. I need a little coloring to really make this look better, <laughs> I think. But. It would have popped a little bit better, but you know, we're not designers. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. Oh, we got to close it with it. Yeah. Save again. Of course, they all have the same functionality because they all have the same class behind them. Mm -hmm. They all have the same look because they all have the same template as well. Now, what's cool about it is I can use this anywhere inside my application, and I know I have this encapsulated functionality. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, pretty neat stuff. Simple. Uh, we have. I mean, this, we haven't gotten to the hard stuff yet. Yeah. But Danny is sending a strong hint that you should be making your font larger. I keep, the... Danny. I keep doing that. Good. Put your freaking glasses on. All right. So. <laughs> I had, I had already seen it. Yeah, that's funny. All right, so back to uh, back to slides. So it really is true. We have this uh, subclassing as simple as that. All right, and uh, now creating a brand new control. This is the idea of creating a control from scratch. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of ways to do that. The first would be, and it seems to be the most obvious, but it might not be the way you end up going, and that is to create a button from control, right? And so we know that we, if we go back to our lineage, we go all the way up. Control gives us pretty much everything that we need, but it doesn't give us a lot of the functionality that's free that comes in other, other uh, base classes, mm -hmm. like content control that we'll talk about in just a second. But if you do go all the way up to control, now the developer must implement everything. Yeah. Every single thing. That includes the click event. It includes all the stuff you're going to do for accessibility. Everything that's there is going to be um, up to you. Um, but syntactically, it's about the same, mm -hmm. right? Just that to do is going to be a lot more full because there's a lot of for things to you to do there, right? Exactly. exactly. If you can actually base it on an existing control, you've got yourself a long way. You've it makes a huge amount of sense to do so. Um, I mean, in, in the hamburger control, for example, uh, that was built as part of template 10, using the radio button as the uh, menu items shortcutted a huge amount of effort to be able to get that functionality. Yeah, without a doubt. Gave this, without a doubt, that's the truth. All right, so let's go back to Visual Studio. And for the sake of explaining this, I will, um, let me delete the, let me just comment out the button that we just created for you and delete the class and its whole implementation. Oh, that's how we think it All right, so easy come, easy go, Darren. <laughs> uh, sorry. That's uh, all right, so I'm inside. I want a refund. I'm inside controls, and I'm going to say add new item. Now, um, I'm not going to say class like we just did because I'm not going to inherit. This is from scratch. I'm going to create a templated control, which is really where we're headed with all this. A templated control that you create that does something very different, very unique, very signature to the mm -hmm. application that you uh, are creating. In this case, we're going to create a very unique uh, my button. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get that name from? Well, <laughs> I looked it up on MSDN as under best practices. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so when I add this, a couple of cool things happen. First of all, you're going to see my class show up under here, my button, just like you would expect. And look, the syntax really hasn't changed except for it's nicely done, the default style key for me. Mm -hmm. That's really, really nice. In this case, it said that the style key is going to be based off of my button, not off of control. It's kind of putting it there so I can edit it if I need to. Yep. 
Um, but out of the box, it's going to apply um, only the one that's made for this class. But if you'll notice, there's also a new folder called Themes. themes. And we had talked about this before, that there's mm -hmm. a generic XAML file inside Themes. And that, and that has all of the default styles for all of the So if you added multiple controls at this box. point, you'd still have that single generic .xaml, but you'd have entries for each of those controls as you built it. That's right. So now if I open up generic XAML, we can see that it's got the style for my, um, for my button. For my button, literally. Mm -hmm. For my my button. My my button. And uh, if I were to create your button now inside controls, which I'll go ahead and do just because that's hilarious, um, I will say your button, your bouton. <laughs> Which is even funnier. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> now, there's not another generic XAML being created. Mm -hmm. There's just the same one. And appended down to it then is your button. So there's your button, and here's my button. Okay. And there's a little bit of a quirk in the code generation here that's worth knowing that'll probably throw every developer for a crazy loop. In fact, let me just go ahead and build this to cause it to happen. Because it's right here, XBF generation error code 0x03e9, which we all know. We know means shift that namespace. <laughs> that namespace must be shift. That's all written in hex, and it, it goes back. We all have, I think all developers have this dictionary of errors. Yeah, absolutely. And this hex value brings us back. To no, no, I think we have a litany of errors. A litany. I think that's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, so I, am, uh, I, don't, I don't need to research what the problem is. I know what the problem is. Uh, here you can see there's a namespace right on the style, which is a neat way to do namespaces in mm -hmm. XAML, actually. So, so that local2 applies um, to here, right? So that's how it gets to my button. Similarly, local2, that doesn't clash because it's scoped to there, uh, gets, that's how you get to your button. That's the error. That's, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Yep. It just needs to be moved up to the resource dictionary and removed altogether from here since it's a duplicate anyway. And uh, now everything will work fine. Control-Shift-B, I'll let it build out. These little squiggles go away. It'll say build succeeded. So as soon as you move that up, that's the solution. We suffer the pain so you don't have to. <laughs> it's a reality. Right. <laughs> I put Bing to the test on that one. That's for sure. All right. So that is the solution to that. Now I have both the style for my button and for your button. And if I were to go in and start making changes, for example, my button always needs to be, as you can remember, background of red and uh, that's the way it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and why not? What I don't have here is the content presenter. That's because when I said create a new um, control, I don't have a content. That content doesn't mm. exist. In fact, if I were to go back to my button and look at it, I would see it goes to, comes from control, not from optionally content control. So here's one of those key decision points: is yes, um, if we cast our minds back to that um, inheritance, we could build our own content control from the ground up at this point. That's or exactly right. we could inherit from the already existing pattern that's been established and get that functionality for free. So let's talk about control versus content control then. So uh, the control itself inherits from framework element, which we saw in that um, kind of uh, family tree that we built. Mm -hmm. right? And that gives us almost all, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, almost all controls inherit from this. But yeah. uh, it gives us basically everything we need in order to be rendered up in the XAML tree. Um, but what it doesn't give us is the content property. And yeah. so you're wondering what the difference between content control and control. Content control gives us a predefined content property as well as content template and content transitions. Both of those are very important. Content template injects that presenter for us. Theoretically, you could just roll with it. And mm -hmm. so it's a nice option. In fact, content control doesn't have to be subclass. Nope. You could just use it right in XAML. It's ready to go. So it, inheriting from that gives you the content property, which... Nine times out of ten, I would imagine you're going to build the content. Yeah, most control. controls are going to want to have display content. That's right. What's that content transition do? That allows us to use gratuitous animations in our applications. I knew if anybody would get excited about that <laughs> property. <laughs> <Bing>! <laughs> All right, so let's just pretend we decided to use control, but we, had to, we are going to build our own content control, right? So the content control does not exist. What is it really giving us? This is basically the way that it looks, right? And so we have... A, a, um, an attribute, an attribute mm -hmm. uh, that you put like on the class, day. right? That is the content property. And in this case, what's, which property is it? The content, it's a property called content. So this is the way the content control works as well. And so down here you can see we've got uh, of type UI element, a property right here called content. This is where you would put in whatever uh, XAML you wanted inside your control. And then uh, you can see the definition down here because it's a dependency property. 
that uh, that's the reason we want it as a dependency property so we can use template binding later. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so that's the definition. That's all we have to do, and then we would get it from there. Of course, there's more to do. We haven't done the templating. We haven't done transitions. All those things would have to be done manually as well. So we get that for free. But if you were going to build your own content control, at its heart, this is really what it's doing on the inside. Yeah. Yeah, so if uh, you feel like you simply cannot inherit from co content control and you wish you could, here's your solution. Yeah. And the take great a, thing take about that. Take a screenshot of this slide. Exactly. And the great thing about that content property attribute is a lot of the reasons people don't want to use content control is they don't, aren't aware that you can change what that default property is. Yeah. And so by using this attribute, if you need it to be something else, yeah. it's very simple. Like primary commands or something like that. Yeah. Content still is there, but then you don't have to use it exactly. Exactly. That's the way the command bar works. It has a content control or content property, but it also has primary and secondary commands that work the same way. Primary is the default, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. All right. So that's creating a templated control, but there is this other thing out there called the user control, and I think it's a worthwhile discussion to decide what you're going to choose. Sometimes a user control, sometimes a templated control. Why would you choose one instead of the other? Genuinely, um, there are reasons to pick both. Right? Yeah. Obviously, it exists for a purpose. I generally start, to be honest, with the user control first. Yeah. Because they're quicker to put together. Just from a uh, replication, re rapid application development scenario, throwing together a user control is a very quick way to prototype an idea. Yeah, it totally is. You have a full designer support right out of the box. You don't have to do anything tricky. And all of a sudden, you can drag things in <laughs> and really compose um, a small fragment of, a of XML that you're putting together and you can and then encapsulate and repeat on pages. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really nice. You can have properties, events, everything that you can have on a templated control. Yep. So why would you possibly create a templated control? Well, a user control doesn't have a template. <laughs> <laughs> dum -dum. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so if you need to make a control that allows for developers or some other consumer to be able to take your control and make it look different, that's not a user control. Sometimes that's perfect, right? You're going to mm -hmm. create a user control that's like um, a login control. That shows how to, you know, shows what to log in, all the logic behind it. It's all encapsulated inside this one user control. Every page needs to have a login, let's say. So you just drag it on. Now all that functionality is there. You're good to go. Beautiful. Yeah. That's a user control. You don't need it to look different as it goes to different pages. But if you're creating a button or if you're creating really anything else that you want to give the flexibility for developers to come in and make a difference or make a change, then the templated control is the right way. It is worth saying there is a slight performance increase for a templated control. Mm -hmm. Because uh, all of generic XAML is going to be uh, compiled into your PRI, that'll be a little bit faster. That's not the reason you would pick one over the other, I don't think. You probably would think about it if you were using a, initially using a user control within a data repeater. That uh, you had hundreds of instances being created and you weren't doing virtualization or something along those lines. You might want to consider it for that performance improvement. But the reality, as you were saying, is you're going to make your decisions based upon, upon your uh, granularity of reuse. Yeah. If you're going to be reusing this thing within the scope of one application, a user control may be all that you need. And it's worth saying, if uh, for newer developers, a user control is just easier, and so it's a great place to start as well. There's nothing wrong with the user control, but um, just know that in the end, you probably will um, graduate to a templated control someday. Yes. And so uh, don't feel like the user control is the wrong choice. Or if you have an uh, open source project, other people may graduate your user controls for you. <laughs> <laughs> like in template 10. That's yes. Exactly right. <laughs> in template 10, we have tons of controls that we've added. And because I am a, uh, a junior developer, I uh, <laughs> created them all as user controls and then conveniently allowed other people to graduate. Other people graduated those for me. Yes. The matriculation of our controls. That's exactly right. OK, so um, let's talk about just the things you do inside a templated control to make them work and things you need to consider. And it starts with the idea of custom properties. Of course, you're going to have properties on your control so you can interact with it, change the special color in this case. <laughs> or maybe you want to uh, determine whether or not it's checked because it's some sort of checkbox-like thing or, or anything else. This is the way you expose it. And doing it as a dependency property gives us a couple of benefits. The first, of course, is you get to data bind and animate. Those two things are, of course, important and the reason you're going to be using it. Uh, Two-way data binding inside a control can only be done with dependency properties. And uh, so this, this question comes up frequently. Why isn't my data binding working in my <laughs> user control or my templated control? That's because you're not using a dependency property. The other thing is uh, if you do it this way, all of a sudden your properties are exposed as, uh, um, to the setter in the style. 
which yes. is just an easy way for a developer to preset some things. So let's say you had special color and unspecial color, or regular <laughs> color, right? And uh, you wanted to set those, but you wanted to preset those all up in your custom style in a resource dictionary you have somewhere. Um, then you can create a style, make, um, associate it then to your object as the target type, mm -hmm. is to whatever special control you've created. And then you say setter property equals, and you get this awesome IntelliSense that shows all the properties that you can set through that. And so this is another benefit of uh, making sure that dependency properties, not standard CLR properties, are what you're using. Yep. And uh, you know, a lot of people, I think, are somewhat intimidated by them because of the syntax. It looks very, very different from uh, regular properties. Of course, there are great code snippets out there that actually make them very easy to create. Like PropDP? Yep. Just go into Visual Studio, type PropDP, tab, tab, and you've got it. Yep. Of course, that doesn't use the name of operator, so that's no. normally the first thing we go and change is uh, replace the string for the uh, property name to name of. Yeah, that's right. In fact, let me, um, let me point out a few things. So inside this, um, inside this, we're using, we're not actually reading and writing to a field. We're reading and writing to get value, which we get for free because this is a dependency object. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those, um, if, if we could go back to the lineage, dependency objects like the first one. Yeah. And uh, one Just of the things object. that gives us is, um, yeah, that's right. And what it gives us is this uh, get and set value so we can interact with dependency properties. And then we register. So this is, a, this is all done statically here. So this is done right before your application is, is uh, instantiated. You get it, uh, you register. And this is what Darren was talking about. What are you registering? Uh, the, what are you associating? What property are you associating to? In this case, it's special color goes up to special color. And we're using name of because then we don't have literal strings. It's also okay. worth pointing out that the dependency property by convention is called spe the uh, variable name with property appended to it. That's right. So when you see special color and then this property right under it, right, that's just convention. You yes. can name it you know, puppy if you had to. That'd be a strange app, wouldn't it? That would be, yes. Well, it's a dog calendar app. Oh, yeah. You know, Microsoft needs one of those. Um, then, uh, then you set up its type. That's only for setters, so, so the setter guarantees its type. When it returns, it's an object, and you get to recast it, which is terrific. But perhaps even more so is this idea of property metadata here at the end, the final thing you're passing in to um, when you register, and that is um, the default value. In this case, you can see the default color is Gainsborough, but there's also an over ride, load, overload, override, overload. overload. There's an overload to property metadata that allows you to pass in a callback so that whenever this property is updated, you can take some sort of action. So we're not doing that here, but you yeah, could. But often you would. It's kind of interesting when you look at your sketch that there, uh, it looks like one of those chalkboards that after the course where you've taken a photo of it, it makes no sense yeah. whatsoever. Like, okay, there's a lot of lines. <laughs> what, what are those lines? This goes to there. Yeah. There's the, this guy. Yeah, and E running. equals MC squared. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> That's right. Did you save that? No, I threw it away. No! All right, perfect. All right, now what about localization? Yeah, quick jump. Yes, so uh, localization is handled also. In, I mean, your control needs to be localizable as well, of course. And uh, the way localization works today, so let's just not talk about custom controls. These are the out-of-box controls. I have a text block. That text block right here it has an XUID. Remember, that XUID is not its name or its ID. This is its reference back to a resource. And then, so inside that resource then, which we would create and of course, this isn't a class about localization, just mm -hmm. conceptually. Yep. Um, you could set its text property, you could set its foreground property, you could set whatever property you want. All of those then could map to those custom properties that you created in our previous slide. So how do you do localization? You make sure that everything that needs to be exposed for localization is exposed as a property in your control. Yeah. The end. And that, that's the reality. There is no ability to intrinsically build in localization yeah. in those controls. You, would, you wouldn't put XUID inside your template. That yes. doesn't work. Nice. Okay, let's talk about events in your control. Um, we are accustomed inside XAML of having uh, routed events. So that's nice and powerful. And the good news about routed events is they both bubble and tunnel. Yep. Yes, bubble events uh, go up like bubbles in champagne. Indeed. Mm. And tunnels don't go through champagne at all. No, no. no. <laughs> well, talk about an analogy that breaks down exactly. fast. <laughs> all right, so bubbling goes up, and so it goes up the visual tree. Yeah. And as you go up the visual tree, it means that a parent Sometimes or Sometimes known as parent, champagne. <laughs> they can also handle or attach to those events, right? So that's really nice. You don't have to be in it. 
And uh, that's a bubbling event. As it tunnels, it goes down through, and the children receive the same event as well. So that's what the good news, awesome. The, um, the, the news you should know <laughs> is uh, you're <laughs> not going <laughs> to create one like it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Only WinRT, uh, the platform itself, can create routed events. What you can do is custom bubble those up by making sure the routed event args are what are in your event, or you can create a custom, a regular event like we're nor- used to of, uh, with uh, just regular event args, and then that would have, um, that would have no bubbling, no tunneling. Mm-hmm. Right? So just be aware of that. But we're pretty accustomed to that in C Sharp. So sure. And of course, one of the key things, if you do handle a bubbled event and you, you don't want anybody else to take any actions on it, you're going to specify that you've handled it. That's right. Once you're inside the behavior part, that's the class itself, and you're trying to interact with the items in, so that if you're in a user control, life is easy because they're, they're coupled together and the objects are just fields inside mm-hmm. your control. Um, but once you've separated that and the template is no longer known to the implementation, how are you going to reference the parts that are in there? Well, we call those template parts. <laughs> it's strange. If you're a, a WPF or a Silverlight developer, no, no, just Silverlight. If you're a Silverlight developer and you know how to create a templated control, then you have seen template part, the attribute that you would add to your class, that you would pass in the name that's go- that it's going to locate inside your template and what type it's going to be. What's great about that is Blend then looks at that and ensures that when somebody uh, tries to restyle or retemplate a control, they do it correctly. And it's worth knowing that at least in WinRT, uh, template part really is ignored. It still works yes. fine, doesn't break anything, but you're not adding functionality to your control by adding template part attribute anymore. Um, maybe someday it will be, but it's not today. And yep. so if you're wondering why isn't this making a difference, it's because it, it's not used. Yeah, that's right. But it's important that we keep it there because, um, you know, template or I mean uh, controlled developers are accustomed to that. You don't want to wreck their ship. Right. And then how do you actually access those controls? Well, that's by calling uh, right here, uh, get template child. So every control then has on template applied. That is an override that is called after the template is actually rendered. Then I can call another method that I've got called get template child. That is, uh, that's also given to me at, through inheritance. So I can pass in whatever that name might be. In this case, you can see it's my button. And then I'll just cast it because it comes back as an object. Now I have a field reference that I can use, attach to the click event, do anything mm-hmm. that I want. Now I have a reference to a control that's inside the template, but I'm inside my implementation. Which is one of the main reasons why you want to start by copying a uh, template as opposed to trying to start from empty because if you neglected to put that template child in there, yeah. then you're going to have a problem at this point because that's going to be null. Yep. Uh, and there's also a, a similar way to reference visual states in an attribute, and uh, that's also ignored in WinRT. So that's worth saying. We didn't have a slide on it, though. All right, another thing you're going to need to do inside your control is to be able to handle vis- uh, focus visuals. And this will be important for accessibility and, uh, and just niceness, too. Uh, inside, uh, so as of Windows 10, um, the XAML framework has changed, or the platform has changed just a little bit so that you don't no longer have to draw your own focus visuals. So remember how complicated the visual tree was that Darren showed us for a list view. Um, imagine how much more complicated it would be if we also had to draw a dotted line around everything that was focused. You'd have all these other pieces as well. Mm-hmm. So you'll see uh, uh, these changes to the XAML uh, platform. Many of them are trying to reduce the, the tree so that there's less memory usage as well as it just is uh, more performant as well. So how do we interact with that? Well, we use system focus visuals as true. As soon as you say true to that, we inherit that from control. It automatically is drawn uh, a box around the, the bounding box around your uh, control for you automatically, and that's pretty nice. Um, you can also say, is template focus, focus target true and false? This means whether or not, this is sort of like a tab stop. Mm-hmm. It, will, um, it will no longer participate in any of the focus business for you. Uh, that's really great, and especially great if you're using a screen reader where you're trying to find an object on the screen, and so you can take yourself out of that and not participate in that for, if it's uh, just noise. And then finally, uh, if you need to make your own focus visual, uh, that's not the wrong thing. There are controls that still do yep. that. And um, if you have to, then the right way to do it, obviously, is some sort of visual state that you call your focused visual state or whatever it is that you call it as well. There's a lot of things that you'll need to handle for that. Nice enough, the control, which is in your lineage, gives you a focused event that's still going to occur. You're yep. still going to want to say, is template focus target true? So you still get focus. Yes. The control will give you that, and then you handle everything from there. Yeah. yeah. It can create an awful lot of work, and that's one of the reasons why I think the simplification has been done, because you have 
multiple scenarios where you're dealing with a mouse over event and you want to change um, some sort of color. And then if you're also going to be focused on all of these things, they all compile together. So you end up creating multiple visual state groups to handle all of these scenarios. So it's a great simplification. And if it makes sense, I would use what comes out of the box. Darren, we created a Templeton, and it has several controls inside it. Some mm -hmm. are user controls, some are templated controls. And this is what it looks like when you package it for NuGet. And it's not, it's, it's an, it's, it's not unusual for developers to take um, implementations and package it either publicly on NuGet.org or privately, internally on uh, a NuGet site, which is pretty easy to set up. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to share code with your team. If you do that, um, there's a couple of things that are at least worth pointing out. Um, we have, for example, shipped in the NuGet package the, X, the XAML, which you wouldn't think we would send that. But if you don't have the XAML, then you don't get design time support. Yeah. And so you can see here in the controls folder uh, that we have included the XAML so that you get that design time support. Now, you might be wondering if you're familiar with the new binary format of XAML, why we're not shipping the XBF. The reason we're not shipping the XBF is because it's not compiled because we have selected any CPU, which mm -hmm. brings us to the IL version, not to the machine language version. But you'll also see we ship themes and uh, themes generic XAML. We don't have to do any work with this. This is automatically um, rolled in whenever anybody uses our package. But we do have to ship it with it um, for the sake of design time. Yes. Um, because down here in, t in the uh, library PRI, that is the compiled version of the generic XAML. So if you're wondering where all of those de definitions are in real life, they're in the PRI. Where are they at design time? They're in generic XAML, so you can use them. So that's, that part's really nice. If you're packaging it up, you'll want to create these. In fact, I might just show real quick that if you have a library, I put a little fake library here that has nothing. But if you have a library that you are putting your controls in, um, one of the things you want to do is go to the Build tab here and scroll down to uh, the Output Path and make sure that you generate the library layout. This will create all those subfolders that basically match this styles, all your styles that you might send, uh, the controls, any XAML that's in there as well, as well as your themes, uh, uh, your generic XAML and themes will all be shipped out for you as well. So you don't have to go find each of the files, move them out. No, no, you just copy this one folder that uh, the system creates for you. It makes it real easy to package in NuGet. Really nice. Absolutely. All right, the last thing is just a quick tip. If you are going to do that and you're going to have a generic XAML, and you've decided to break your, your generic XAML up because it's just too gigantic and you don't want to scroll for eternity, uh, you might break it up to a resource dictionary. And if you're going to do that, that is fully supported. Just make sure that you um, fully qualify the source. Don't just use a relative source mm -hmm. to, to access that. That's the only trick to remember there. And uh, everything else is kind of magical the way that it works. Absolutely. So, you know, quick summary. You reviewed control fundamentals. Mm. You know, which really uh, gave a great deal of insight into how these controls are built up in a layered fashion. Yeah, that Talk lineage. That lineage. We talked about subclassing an existing control, so how you can get a leg up in building your own custom control. That's right. And then took the on the ways, challenge. The many ways of creating a new control. Yeah. yeah. Subclassing a control, retemplating a control, or just straight from scratch creating a control that you need. Often, inheriting from control is a little... Um, introduces a lot more work than you might actually want. Mm -hmm. And subclassing just makes sense. Yep. Sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't. So we covered right. how you would approach creating the new controls from scratch. All right. Um, I think it'd be cool if we created a really sophisticated control. Maybe we'll do that in the next module. Maybe. We'll Maybe have, we won't. We'll decide in the next few moments. See you again.